Vibrant Church, what is up? My name is TJ. I'm the pastor of Coastal Community Church, but I am so excited to be with you guys this weekend. While it's a little bit different than being there in person, I am pumped to be with you online. I absolutely love, love, love your church. I love what God is doing through you guys, but more than that, I love your pastors. Like, Pastor Brandon and Jonna are some of my favorite people, and as I've gotten to know them over the last couple years, the one thing I've realized about Pastor Brandon is he is an incredible man, he's an incredible leader, he's an incredible pastor, but he's an even better friend, and uh, I'll never forget the first time I met Brandon, he had come down to check out this area, South Florida area. By the way, I live in South Florida as well. And he had showed up to one of our campuses at the time and went through a service and actually asked to meet with my wife and I. And we got asked to meet by church planters all the time. But this was the first time I ever sat down with a church planter. And I said to myself afterwards, this guy is a great pastor. And I want you to know, Vibrant Church, you have got an incredible pastor. And uh, I, I love him. I love the, 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 the Sareg family. Incredible, incredible family. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is TJ. I pastor a church called Coastal Community Church in Parkland, Florida. So just a little bit north of you guys. But I... I I am excited to be with you. I've loved the journey of watching and seeing what God has done in your church in the last almost a year now uh, and how God has used you to reach the area of plantation and to make a difference there. And I'm excited to speak to you guys today. And what I'm excited to talk to you about today is this idea of adventure. Now, I'm a, a person that absolutely loves adventure. I believe that God designed you, he designed me to live an adventurous life. And, and I believe that he has got this incredible calling within each and every one of us. And uh, in some reason, in this day and age, we have lost this spirit of adventure. And What's interesting is when we were younger, we all had it. I, I, I'm a product of the 80s and 90s. And when I was a kid, we used to uh, go outside and play. I know that the kids today, they don't have any idea what going outside means. They're like inside on video games. But we used to go outside and like go and run around and play and come up with all these scenarios and have these great adventures outside. And, and in fact, we were so adventurous that that if that our parents, when they would, we would be outside playing, they would tell us, be home by this time, which every kid of the 80s and 90s knows exactly what I'm talking about. We had to be home by either supper or dark. Either one, it was, it was an adventure. In fact, I would say that our parents were actually more adventurous than us because they had no clue where we were. But we loved adventure. I loved creating. I loved going out and doing crazy, crazy things. And Today, you don't ever see kids outside. You don't ever see people doing adventurous stuff. They're all stuck inside. And somewhere, somehow, in some way, some form or fashion, we have lost this sense of adventure. Now, I am kind of an adrenaline junkie kind of guy. If there is something stupid and dangerous and you need somebody to do it with you, like typically I'm the guy that jumps in and does that. Come on, all of my adventure people, go ahead and type in there. I'm an adventurous person in your comment section. Go ahead and go, that's me right now. I, I want to identify all the crazy people that are like me. Uh, and so a couple of years ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to Cape Town, South Africa, we went on a mission trip, and then we stayed afterwards for a little bit of rest and relaxation, and, and we got to go hike Table Mountain, which is one of the, the new uh, eight wonders of the world. And while we were there, my wife knows that I have all these bucket list items of crazy things to do. And while we were there, she said, hey, I want to know, TJ, are you interested in going shark diving with great white sharks? And I was like, am I interested? I, yeah, let's do it. She's like, that's good because I already purchased the ticket for you to go. And I just want to tell you, Vibrant uh, Coastal Community Church, no matter where you are and watching, that, that when you find a good wife, in fact, the Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing 
and finds favor from the Lord. I found a good thing in my wife. And I was like, yeah, babe, let's go shark diving. She's like, no, 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 no. I'm not going shark diving. You're going to go shark diving. And so I, I drove to this place. Uh, it was winter in South Africa. So I went out on this boat. We were going to this little place called Seal Island. Uh, the te water temperature was about 25 degrees. How many of y'all know that's cold? It's cold when it's 25 degrees. And, and we're making our way out to this place called Seal Island to go shark diving. And there are these huge swales um, because there was a, a front that was coming in. So we're like going over these huge swales. It is crazy. There's all these tourists from all over the world that have paid all kinds of money to go swimming with great white sharks. And so as we're going out, I'm, I'm asking the, the boat captain, like, hey, why, why are we going to this place called Seal Island? He's like, oh, the reason we're going to Seal Island is because great white sharks like to snack on seals. I was like, oh, that's a, that's a good idea. And he's like, so because there's hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of seals going to this island, great whites are always around. And I, I was like, that's a, that's, a, that's a good reason. And I said, so what's going to happen? He says, well, when we get to the spot, uh, we're going to chum up the water. We're going to throw a whole bunch of, you know, bloody fish in the water. And then we're going to throw out some like fake looking seal things and drag them through the water to attract these great white sharks. And I was like, okay, cool. And so we get to the spot. Uh, they're, they're, they're starting to drop the cage into the water that you go into. And they say, hey, everybody that wants to go in the water and experience a great white shark, uh, go ahead and put on a wetsuit and uh, go ahead and get it in line. And people at this point, because of the swales, are feeling kind of ill and sick. And so they're helping chum up the water a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and, and I'm the only person that raises my hand to actually get in the water. I'm thinking to myself, all of you people paid all this money to see great white sharks and you're going to stay on the boat? And I'm like, but I don't care. And I start putting on the, the wetsuit and I realized that when you get into a wetsuit, you know what you look like? You look like a seal. Like they were setting me up for failure, and, but I didn't care. I jump in this cage, and, and it's freezing. As soon as my body hits the water, I'm in this wetsuit. My, my teeth start chattering, and all of a sudden, you know what happened? I peed my pants. I know TMI, but I'll tell you what, it was the greatest moment ever because I don't know if you know this or not, but your urine is warm. And inside of a wetsuit, it made it like a heater pack. I know, I know, too much. But So I'm in this cage, and the swells are still coming, and the guy above tells you to dive down. And over the next hour, I saw three great white sharks. In fact, the last one, I was, I was in the cage by myself. I had my GoPro camera with me underwater, and I'm taking pictures. And, and this last one comes up, and he's swimming right towards my cage. And I'm freaking out a little bit in the moment. And right as he gets to my cage, he turns to chase a seal and actually hits my cage. Made me pee my pants again. Come on, somebody, give me an amen right there online. And I remember when I came up out of the cage, the, the guy's like, hey, it, it's time for us to head back. And I said, sir, how, how big was that last great white shark? He said, son, that, that great white shark was about 14 foot long and weighed two tons. 14 foot, 4,000 pound great white shark hit my cage and I remember I was I'm pulling myself out of this cage. I look up on the boat and I see all these people as I'm shivering and freezing from coming out of this sub freezing water. They're warm and they're smiling and they're eating snacks and and at that moment, I was a little bit angry with them. I was like, "Man, I'm I'm dying of hypothermia and you're up here eating snacks and taking pictures of sharks." Like, you don't even deserve to take pictures of sharks, a bunch of losers. He didn't even get in the water. But then I thought to myself, those people got to take pictures of sharks. But I got to experience them. And as I was pulling myself up, I 
I had this thought, you know what those people are? Those people are boat huggers. And I think that so many of us in life stay on boats when we're meant to jump in water. So many of us in life, we stay in the safety and confines of what is secure and what is known instead of stepping out into the unknown of the adventure that God has for each and every one of us that he's placed inside of us and wants us to experience on a daily basis. And God so much wants us to experience this life of adventure by following him. There's a great verse in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. It says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. That, that word new in that scripture is the word yada. And it literally means to know deeply. So before God ever formed anything, before you were ever made, he knew you deeply. And not only did he know you deeply, but he made you with a unique and distinct purpose and God knows the deepest parts of who you are he knows every aspect of who you are he knows how he designed you and wants you to be he just didn't create some lame design he actually calls us his masterpiece and in fact in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 it says for we are God's masterpiece wherever you are I want you to type in masterpiece right now in the comment section it says for we are God's masterpiece he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he planned for us long ago so if you are God's masterpiece then that means that God has got a master plan He's called us to do something great. He's called us to do something outstanding. He's called us to live a life of adventure that he has designed for every single one of us to experience. Now, now here's what I want to know for all of you that are watching online. For those of you that are watching online that you would say, you know what? I love adventure. In fact, I, I, I love adventure so much. What I want you to do is I want you to raise your hand online, put a little hand emoji wherever you are right now. Everybody do that. Come on, all the adventurous people, go ahead and put that a little hand emoji up. Now, now, if you're sitting at home, if you're there with your family, if you want to go on an adventure right now, I know this is going to sound crazy, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up right now. Stand up right now at your home, no matter where you are. Okay, nobody else stand up, nobody else stand up. All those people that are standing up in your home, I want you to look around. Those are the crazy people in your home. Those are the people you gotta look out for. See, this is what I know, is we all have these different groups of people that we know. There's people that are like not for adventure at all. It's all the people that are watching online that did not comment or put a hand emoji up right there. They're not interested in adventure. They like consistency. They, when they go to Chick-fil-A, they order a number one with, with a lemonade. That's what they do every single time they're never going to venture out from what they know and have experienced now there's a different group of people that's those all of those that put their little hand emoji up uh that they, they, they put their hand emoji up but when i asked them to stand they did not stand why because they like the idea of, of adventure in life but yet they will never experience it then there's the crazy people that stood up they are literally the people you need to look out for because they will literally change the world and here's what I know, over time, that adventurous spirit that is deep within every single one of us, if we're not careful, we allow it to deteriorate. We used to be adventurous, but not so much anymore. The reason why? Because we've bought into this idea that we want a safe and we want a predictable life. And we work really, really hard to stay in routines. In fact, Craig Rochelle said this, to step towards your destiny, you're going to have to step away from your security. My question for you today is, is this. Why do we stay in places God has called us out of? Why do we stay in places that God has called us out of? If God has called us to something great in life, why would we settle for anything less than that? And here's what I know. And I'm going to predict about your life. And it's this. 
your biggest regret at the end of your life won't be the things you did. It'll be the things you wished you had done. Your biggest regret at the end of your life won't be the things that you did. It'll be the things that you wished you would have done. In fact, I'm not just making that statement. I actually have research that backs it up from Cornell University. They said when they look at people at a whole of their lives, inaction regrets outnumber action regrets 84% to 16%. What that means is is a lot of us, we go, man, I wish I wouldn't have done this thing. And we all have things in our life that we go, I wish I would not have done that. But they said at the end of your life, you know what you're going to regret more than the things that you did and lived to regret? You're going to regret the things that you never had the trust or the faith or the willingness to step out in. They said your biggest regrets are going to be the ones that you didn't take the chance on. That we didn't step out and live the adventurous life in. And so what that means is we're going to look back and we're going to go, man, I wish I would have traveled more. I wish I would have taken that vacation. I wish I would have gotten involved at church and started serving. I wish I would have taken my, my next steps in life. I wish I would have gone on that mission trip. I wish I would have asked that girl out. That's clue to somebody right now. There you go. That's God speaking to you right now. It's that I wish... And we're not going to be singing Skilo, I wish I was a little bit taller, I wish I was a baller, I wish I had a girl and looked good, I would call her. It's not going to be that I wish. It's going to be the I wishes. Those moments where God was prompting you to do something. And instead of stepping up, you step back. And so if we know that regret which is what inaction is, it's what it leaves us with, is going to be the thing that haunts us most at the end of our life. Why do we abstain from the adventure instead of living for it? I think there's three dangers to your destiny. The first one is this, if you're taking notes, it's discarded dreams. Somewhere along the way in life, we stopped dreaming. In fact, we even talked to a few people about our dreams, but they so discouraged them and so talked down to them that we just stopped dreaming along the way. And at some point, pain happened and life happened and pain replaced our purpose. And now we're just living life. We're just enduring it over and over and over again. I read recently that that men over 40 years old, which I'm just a little bit above, start to close doors to areas of their life that they will never venture back into. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to close any door that God still wants open in my life. I don't want to miss out on the things that God has for my life just because I've missed out on the past. I want to step into those. I want my life to have meaning. I want my life to continue on and the difference I made to continue forward even after I'm gone. I want to fulfill that call that God has given to me. And listen, we've all had moments. Job in the Bible, he had that moment where he lost everything. He lost his wealth. He lost his kids. He was in a terrible marriage. And this is what he said. He says, my days are over. My hopes have disappeared. My heart's desires are broken. And some of you guys feel that way right here, right now. But what you need to understand, while Job thought his life was over, God wasn't finished with Job even though it felt that way. Way. And so many of us, we give up on God before God ever gives up on us. We toss in the towel and God is picking up the towel and throwing it back at us and go, no, no, no. It's time to get back in the game. Don't give up when you're in the middle of getting where you're going. I know right now life is a mess. COVID's got us all jacked up. Come on, somebody. But just because life is messed up doesn't mean that God's not still working right here in this moment to get you where you're going in life. And I realize that sometimes pain takes over. And pain is powerful if it's not harnessed correctly. And some of us, we're going through some heartache. We're going through some distraction. We're going through some brokenness. 
And here's what happens is when your dreams get discarded, all of a sudden you start to lack purpose, you start to lack contentment, you start to lack fulfillment. And maybe things look good, but inside you know, it's like, man, there's just something missing here. And what happens for a lot of us is we end up living on autopilot. You ever lived on autopilot where it's like you go through the day and you're like, man, how did I get to the end of the day? I don't even remember what, what I did today. Like I, I started and I ended and that's all that I really have. And the reason why we end up with days like that is because we're living without purpose in life. We're living out of habit. In fact, you even have autopilot say, sayings that you say to people like, hey, how are you doing? You just say it to anybody. Hey, how's it going? You don't want an answer. When they start telling you how it's going, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. That was a rhetorical question. I didn't really want you to answer. I was, I was just being kind. I was just, I was going on autopilot. And some of us, we're living our life, not just our day, but our life on autopilot. And we've settled into a routine that God never designed for us to settle into. In fact, some of you have built a home where God intended for you just to camp. Meaning you've put down roots when you were just supposed to put some stakes in the ground. You've stayed in a place you weren't supposed to be. In fact, I looked at the, the definition of autopilot. It's a device that provides steering in place of a person. And I don't know what your autopilot is today. Maybe it's an opinion of somebody else. Maybe it's, it's uh, some unmet expectations. Maybe it's a hurtful past. But we need to stop living on autopilot and start living the adventure. For others of us, it's not dist di discarded dreams. It's distracted vision. We have a place we're supposed to be going, but we can't see it anymore. We've lost sight of where we're supposed to be. And here's what I know when you lose sight. You have got to be quiet to see. Your brain's visual cortex delivers information from your ears to your brain, giving you an image of where you're going. In fact, the University of Glasgow confirms this. This is what they say. They say, sounds create visual imagery, mental images, and automatic projections. Sounds, it says, sounds create visual imagery. It says, for example, if you're on the street and you're walking down the street and you hear the sound of a motorcycle, what do you do? You automatically start looking for a motorcycle. Why? Because sounds create visual imagery say you're outside and you hear the sound of an airplane what do you do you start looking up going where is it I hear it so therefore I know it must be somewhere in the vicinity of where I am the reason I tell you that is because some of us have been looking and listening to the wrong voices and now our minds are so filled with the wrong ideas and now we are looking for the wrong thing in life and what God wants to do is he wants to clear the slate and he wants to give you a vision from himself. He wants to give you a vision for every single aspect of your life. And this is important for us to make sure we have the right people around us. This is the reason we need to have the right voices in our life. This is the reason why we have to distance ourselves from the world and get clear on whose voice we're listening to. In fact, if you want the answer to your distracted vision, it says in Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 21. This is Jesus speaking. It says, when they came to the crowd, a man came to him and knelt before him saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Then Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebukes the demon, and it says he came out of him, and the child was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. For truly I say to you, 
If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will be moved. Nothing will be impossible for you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Jesus right here in this passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 17, he goes, man, I, 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 here's the problem and here is the answer to distracted vision, vision. right here in this pa passage. He, he says, man, you're a faithless generation. What does that mean? It means you're disconnected from God. That is some of our problem. The reason we have distracted vision is we are disconnected from God. And then he says, he also calls them perverse, which the reason he calls them perverse is because we're too connected to the world. Some of us were disconnected to God and we're so plugged into the world and we're wondering why is my vision so distracted? But he just doesn't give us the problem. He actually gives us the answer. He says, man, how this changes by prayer. What does prayer do? It connects you to God, right? Prayer connects us to God. It gets us in union. It gets us in communion. It gets us in relationship with God. And then he says this other word that is not very popular today, fasting. What does fasting do? It disconnects me from the world. It's one of the reasons why we feel it's so important to pray and fast and disconnect from the world so we can connect to our creator and experience him in the fullness of that. And some of us today, you're listening, and you know right now you've been so connected to those screens. You've been so connected to CNN and Fox News and, and every other whim that's out there, and you've been disconnected from God's word. Today is the day to reconnect to the source of life so that we won't have a distracted vision anymore. Third one is, is disbelief in life. Somewhere along the way, we just... Say, it isn't possible for God to do something great with me in my life. And we think that our life has disqualified us or taken us away from ever having the opportunity for God to do something great inside of us. And listen, God never gets a case of mistaken identity. He's never going to mistake somebody else with you and go, oh, well, you're not qualified, so I'm going to pick this person. No, 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 no. God, God knows who he calls and calls who he knows. And he called you and he didn't make a mistake when he called you and when he created you and he made you that way. You just have to answer the call. God is calling and the phone is ringing. Will you answer the call? And the enemy, his goal in life is to try to disqualify us from that call. His goal is for us to not see the possibilities that God has for you. And listen, this is what I know, is when you're blinded to the possibilities of your future, you will always see settle for the familiarities of your past. And that's the enemy's goal, was to blind you from the possibilities of your future. So you'll settle for what has happened in the past. And God's going, no, 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 no. I've got something new for you today. And some of you, you're in a place where you are not supposed to be. You're in a place that you were never meant to be. I recently had a major tragedy in my life for like the third time this has happened. Uh, I have a particular pair of jeans that is my favorite pair of jeans. And uh, I was actually preaching one weekend. And in the middle of at, at our last service, which was our sixth service of the weekend on a Sunday morning, I was walking off the stage and Shayla goes, hey, do you know that you have a big hole in the crotch area of your jeans? I was like, what are you talking about, woman? I don't, what do you? and I looked down and I had this huge, I ripped a huge, huge hole in my favorite pair of jeans. And you know, when you find a favorite pair of jeans, like you just wear those jokers like crazy. At least I do. If you don't, I'm sorry, you've never had a great pair of jeans. When you can find a great pair of jeans, like they are your go-to. They're soft. They feel right. They're broken in, in the right places. And, and she's like, you got to get rid of those jeans. But you know what? I'll be wearing them. And I was wearing them a couple of days later after that. And she's like, are those your holy jeans? I was like, but babe, they're just, they're just so comfortable. She's like, they're getting thrown in the trash when we get home today. I'm taking them off of you, son, and we are throwing them in the trash. The crazy thing is, is that a lot of times what we do is we live our lives like that. We're sitting in an old mentality when God has called us to something new. Here's the thing. When my wife threw those jeans away, you know what that meant? I got to buy some new jeans. 
And I found some new ones that were even more comfortable than the old ones. But a lot of us, we're so stuck in our old ways that we never move into the new. When God has got something so much better for us and the old is hindering us from the greater new. So how do we discard the mentalities and move forward into our destiny? Number one, if you're taking notes, you have got to believe again. You've got to believe that God has called you, that God can use you, but, and it doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made or how bad you've messed up or, or how your brain operates. It is a good thing that God is not looking for perfection in life. He's just looking for you to have progress. He's just looking for you to take your next step every single day to look more and more like his son, Jesus. And, and the Bible says that we are made perfect in him. That word perfect actually means complete. We are made complete in God, not by our own works. In fact, all you have to do is look at the 12 disciples to realize that, man, God is not looking for perfection because those guys were not perfect. They were not the brightest group. They were not the smartest group. They were not the group with the most aptitude. In fact, they did some really, really, really dumb things. They did some crazy things. They did things that people look at today and they're like, man, those, those dudes just did not have a clue. In fact, there's one point in Acts chapter 4, th- 4 13 where Peter and John have gotten captured, and this is what the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. The word ordinary in there is originally the word, the Greek word idiota. It's where we get our word idiot. So it says the, the really smart people realized that the people who had been with Jesus were idiots, but yet the being with Jesus changed everything about them. So what does that mean for you and I? It means you don't have to have it all together. You don't have to have it all going on. What it means is that we just need to get a little bit of time with Jesus and believe that he can use you because God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called in life. And the closer you get to his son, Jesus, the more you'll realize that God wants to speak to you, that God wants to awaken things in you, that God wants to do great things through you. And here's what I know is the closer you get to Jesus will cause you to get closer and closer to adventure and crazy things. You want to know why? Because the crazier the situation, you know, the more you run to Jesus. They go hand in hand. Number two, you got to go all in. You got to go all in. You got to say, God, whatever you got, I'm all in. I'm going all the way. I'm just going to dive in even though I don't understand it. A few years ago, I had some friends of mine. I'm, I'm, while I love crazy and dangerous i'm not really an outdoorsy guy i know that we have like mountains back here but like uh like i don't really do that like my idea of of like backpacking backpacking hiking uh camping is like staying in a bad hotel uh that's that's like camping to me and uh my friends called me up and said hey uh, a bunch of us are going out to montana to go fly fishing i'm not really a fisherman i'm more of like a golfer mall shopper kind of person you know like uh i that's 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 my therapy i do retail therapy and so they're like hey let's let's go to montana you fly out we'll meet there we'll go we'll go stay in this cabin and we'll go fly fishing i was like man that's not really my thing and and i heard you know i heard my wife go man you just you need to go and so i was like all right man i i i I will go and i remember flying to montana uh i get off the plane it's like two two terminals at this airport it's like smallest airport i've ever been in that's not in a third world country and um, i get off the plane and we go straight to this to the little bighorn river and i'm wearing something similar to what i'm wearing right now that i thought was very very appropriate for montana i thought camouflage jeans i like i i totally fit in with there and i get there and uh the god looks at me and he, and he goes are you wearing that son and I, and I look back at what he was wearing and i was like sir are you wearing that because you know and uh 
And, and so we started this dialogue, and he goes, hey, listen, we're going we're gonna to fish today. Do you want to do a long float or a short float? And I'm like, what, what's a long float? He's like, well, that's eight hours down the river. I'm like, God, no. Let, what's, let, let's go with a short float. I said, by the way, what is that? He's like, oh, that's four hours. I was like, that's about three hours and 50 minutes longer than I want to go. And, uh, and so we get on this boat, and, and we're doing, he's teaching us how to, how to cast the fly fishing thing, and, and uh, you know, uh, in this whipping motion, and, and and so I, I'm, I'm doing this, and he's telling me that like I'm kind of like a natural at it, and of course I am. I'm a you know an athlete, so uh, I can do this all day long. Um, and, and so we get going down the the river. About five minutes in, my ADD kicks in. I'm like a, a three year old, like oh, you know how kids are when they're like just not enjoying something. Like you can you can see it all over them. That was me on on the river. And so we're going down. I am bored out of my mind. Other guys are doing this. Nobody is. Catching Catching a thing. Like, we're three hours and 45 minutes in. Nobody's caught a thing. I'm bored out of my mind. And he says, hey, we're about 15 minutes from our pickup point. And all of a sudden, I realize the most important thing when you're fishing with other people, and that is, is I can win this. Because if I catch something, I, I beat everybody at this point. And so I, I get the fly, and I start casting out there. And, I, and I'm casting, I'm casting, and I, I'm talking smack to the other boats that are around me with my friends on it. And uh, I'm a beat you. And, and, and so I go to cast. And as I'm back in my casting motion, he goes, stop. And I stop and I'm like, is everything okay? He's like, oh, you caught something. And I was like, sir, what, I caught something? He's like, yeah, you caught yourself. I, I'd hook myself on the back and that's the end of my fly fishing days. And, but I took this step to go do something that I would never do on my own. It's a game changer for me. God revealed some things to me on that trip. And so many times we stay in the safety of what we know rather than diving all in. And so my question for you today is when is the last time you went all in? I'll never forget, I'm standing on 7.29 acres of property right here in Parkland, Florida. And I'll never forget when a realtor sent me this property, and it was listed at $3.8 million. We were just a small church plant at the time. And we were in the middle of 21 days of prayer and fasting, seeking God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and strength, disconnecting from the world so we could connect to him. And I remember looking at this property and thinking to myself, well, there's no way we could ever afford that. Maybe they would split that property in half. And as I was contemplating this and saying that to myself, God spoke to me and said, hey, TJ, you're going you're gonna to buy that property for $1.2 million. And I thought to myself, man, that, was, that, that might be bad pizza or something. But we were fasting, so it couldn't be that. And, uh, and so I, 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 I just kept that in my spirit. I called up the realtor that had sent us the property. And I said, hey, I, I'm really interested in that property in Parkland. Uh, could you call up those, those people and ask um, if they'd be willing to split the property up. And he called them up and said, no, 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 they're not willing to split the property up. But they said, why don't you go take a look at it and they'll cut you a great deal. And so we came out here with some of the trustees of our church and looked at this property, 7.29 acres, right on University Drive in one of the premier communities of of. South Florida, and we were like, man, that would be perfect. That would be incredible, but there's no way we can afford that. We called them back and said, man, we love the property. Uh, we just can't afford it. And they said, hey, what, we'll cut your deal. We'll sell it to you for like $2.8 million. And I was like, well, thank you for that discount. That's still way above my budget. And, uh, and as we started talking to them, I, I, I was talking to the trustees, which are the financial leaders in our church. And, and I said, man, I really feel like God has called us to buy this property, and we're going to buy it for the $1.2 million. And they said, TJ, you are crazy. You are smoking crack. That's a normal occurrence at our church. And so I, I, I just felt it in my spirit. And I'm so thankful that there's some people that trust me and trust when I feel like God is talking to me. And so I, I called up our realtor and I said, hey, we're going to put in an offer on that piece of property. Uh, and he's like, yeah, it's $2.8 million. And I was like, yeah, yeah. So we're going to put in an offer at a million dollars. He's like, please don't embarrass me. I was like, I'm not embarrassing you. I, I promise. I believe that God has spoken. 
spoken to me, and, and I, I didn't do what God told me to do, but I lowballed it. And so the, he called it up, told them the offer. Within a day, they got back to us, and they said, hey, we reject your offer. It's not significant enough. We actually have a bigger offer. But here's the deal. We really want to sell this property to a church, so if you'll come up to $1.25 million, we'll sell you that property. Now I was like, sold. Just Three days ago, uh, I heard of a property right up the street, less than a uh, half a mile away from us, that's seven acres that just sold for $14 million. See, there's something about going all in for God and risking your reputation in the middle of it. And see, when I was making those offers to that bank where people were telling me I was crazy, it wasn't my word or my reputation that was at stake. It was God's reputation. Because I didn't think we could do it, but God was saying, no, 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 here's what you're going to do, and here's how much you're going to pay. And listen, I just want to tell you today, you can never build God's reputation if you're worried about your own. And some of us, we're so worried about our street cred instead of building God's cred. We're so worried about our kingdom instead of building God's kingdom. We need to be making much of him instead of much of us. We need to be making much of Jesus instead of making a name for ourselves. And when we do that, we'll see him in the middle of our lives like never before. Last thing, number three, is trust God can do what you can't. Trust God can do what you can't. See, God doesn't call us to do hard things for him. He calls us to do impossible things through him. But you have to trust him in the middle of the adventure. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within you and his work within myself, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let me be honest and blunt with you. I read that scripture, but I think most of us have the opposite mentality. We don't care if God is able. Why? Because we want to be able. That's why so many of us are passive in life. That's why so many of us hesitate taking steps of faith because we're waiting for our ability to come into play instead of believing that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. We're standing on the sidelines seeking safety and security and God's going step into the game and experience the thrill of seeing me do what you can't naturally do. And so many of us, we aren't taking steps of faith because we're afraid of making mistakes more than we are on missing out on opportunities in life. One of my favorite quotes in life is a quote from a guy named Leonard Ravenhill. He's an old revivalist, and he says, the opportunity of a lifetime, the opportunity that every single one of us are longing and waiting for in life must be seized within the lifetime of that opportunity. Listen, church, your God moment is right in the middle of where you are right now. God's got a great plan. God's got an incredible plan. He's got an incredible adventure. But you've got to be willing to step in and step out into everything that he has for you. To put yourself into a place where you will believe that he can and he will do what only he can do, while I and you do what only you can do, which is a step into that place. It's a great verse in Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. It says, Peter fairly exploded with his good news. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. Listen, that, that's for somebody today. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and you're ready to do as he says, he says the door is open. Listen, church, the door is open. If you want to experience all that God has for you 
and do what he says, the door is wide open. Will you step through? Will you take the challenge to follow him into the adventure of a lifetime? Would you guys bow your heads and pray with me? Maybe you're here online and you're watching and you've allowed some of your dreams to be stolen or hijacked or had your vision discarded or whatever it may be. But I believe that God has got an open door for you. And maybe today is the day that you need to walk through it. Maybe for the first time in a long time or the first time ever. And if you're watching online and you've never made a decision to walk through the door of a relationship with a God who loves you. In fact, he loved you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to down a cross for you. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to have you pray a prayer with me. In fact, if that's you, if you would just kind of say, that's me in, in the comment section right now, that you, you want to walk through that door, maybe for, for the first time or the first time in a long time, or maybe, maybe you've just been pl- complacent in your relationship with God, and you're saying, you know what, it's time for me to step up and step out. God, I just pray right now for every single person that is watching online that they would not stay in a complacent place, but God, they would step up and step out into the adventure that you have for them. And God, here's what I also know. There are some people that are watching and and right now you're working on their heart and they're going, man, I've never opened the door to Jesus being a part of my life. And, And if that's you out there, if you would just pray this prayer in your heart, you say, God, I need you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to Come to this earth and die a sinner's death and rise again so that I can have life and have it more abundantly. Today, I walk through the door of relationship. I invite you into my heart and into my life. Change me, transform me, help me to have the faith to step out and allow you to do what only you can do inside of me. Not through my gifts or my talent or my ability, but through yours and yours alone. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.